Welcome to the Memory Matters virtual talk series sponsored by the Johns Hopkins Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. My name is Corinne Pettigrew, and today I'm going to give you a brief overview of dementia and cognitive decline. So to accomplish this goal, I'm going to start by defining dementia, discussing cognitive decline in normal aging and dementia. I'm going to provide a brief overview of Alzheimer's disease, including some of the changes in the brain that occur throughout the course of this disease, as well as the course of symptoms and their treatment implications. I'm going to discuss the different types of clinical research and then leave you with a call to action. So one of the main points I want to make today is that dementia is a general term that refers to the gradual loss of memory and or other mental abilities that's severe enough to interfere with daily functioning and everyday activities. So what I mean by daily functioning and everyday activities are things like cooking, shopping, maintaining the household, and managing finances. And importantly, dementia is caused by progressive disease-related damage to brain cells. So you can think of dementia then as an umbrella term. That is, it refers to a broad category of brain diseases that includes things such as Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, Parkinson's disease dementia, frontal temporal dementia, as well as Lewy body dementia. So the two types of dementia on the left, Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia, are our two most common types of dementia, along with mixed dementia, which means that an individual shows multiple different types of dementia-related pathologies in their brain. And today, we're going to focus particularly on Alzheimer's disease. It's important to note that dementia is different from normal aging. So this is illustrated in the figure on the left. In normal aging, shown by the green lines, everyone experiences slight cognitive changes. Some may experience a little bit of cognitive change, some with slightly greater change, but overall, these changes are quite minor. In contrast, individuals with dementia, shown by the blue and red lines, experience a long clinical trajectory with much greater rates and degrees of cognitive decline. So let's look at some differences between normal aging and dementia. In normal aging, an individual might have difficulty multitasking. They might need to focus on one thing at a time, but they can successfully complete the task. In contrast, an individual with dementia has difficulty concentrating and multitasking. In normal aging, an individual is able to keep up with conversations. They might have to pay a little bit more attention to do so, but they're ultimately able to keep up and engage. In contrast, an individual with dementia has difficulty keeping up with conversations and might not be able to engage or participate. In normal aging, an individual's judgment and decision-making and insight remain intact. So there might be some errors in judgment every once in a while, but this is in contrast to dementia where an individual shows poor judgment and increased risk-taking, such as when dealing with money or assessing risks. And lastly, in normal aging, individuals are able to care for themselves, whereas over time, as dementia progresses, an individual becomes gradually unable to care for themselves. So as you might know, we're expected to see considerable growth of the U.S. population, particularly of individuals aged 65 and older, between now and 2050. And this is important because age is one of the greatest risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. This doesn't mean that individuals, as they get older, they're going to get Alzheimer's disease, but it does mean that the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease increases with age. And this is important because, as you can see in the figure on the right, this means we're going to see a corresponding increase in the number of individuals affected by Alzheimer's disease between now and 2050. And unfortunately, we currently have no cure for Alzheimer's disease. So we have some treatments that help with some of the symptoms of dementia, such as some of the behavioral symptoms like agitation, but we don't have any treatments that modifies the disease or impact the rate of disease progression. But it's thought that if we can find a treatment that delays dementia by five years, we can have substantial impact in the number of individuals affected by Alzheimer's disease between now and 2050. And this is shown in the, by the dashed line in the figure on the right. So turning to some statistics, Alzheimer's disease accounts for about 60 to 80% of dementia cases 
This means that it currently affects about 5.8 million Americans, with that number projected to increase to 13.8 million Americans by 2050. Two thirds of Americans with Alzheimer's disease are women, and there are important racial and ethnic disparities in the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. So Blacks and African Americans are twice as likely than non-Hispanic whites to have Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, whereas Latinos are one and a half times as likely as non-Hispanic whites. Reasons for these disparities are not well understood. It's thought that some of these disparities might be attributed to differences in the prevalence of cardiovascular risk factors um, between race and ethnic groups. So for example, cardiovascular risk factors such as hypertension, high cholesterol, and diabetes are more prevalent in Blacks and African Americans. And that might account for the increased prevalence of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. However, this is likely not the full picture and more research studies are critically needed to address this issue. So as a brain disease, Alzheimer's disease is characterized by specific changes to the brain. So this includes the abnormal accumulation of beta amyloid plaques and tau tangles. So these are shown in the cartoons on the left. From the top, we can see that beta amyloid plaques accumulate outside of the brain's nerve cells or outside of the brain's neurons, whereas tau tangles accumulate inside the brain's nerve cells. The presence of these two pathologies is thought to result in neuronal injury or loss, which we refer to as atrophy. You can see this illustrated here in the center picture where we have a healthy brain on the left and the brain of an individual with Alzheimer's disease on the right. And you can see that the individual with Alzheimer's disease has a fair amount of atrophy throughout their brain. And importantly, it's thought that this atrophy, or this neuronal injury and loss, is most tightly linked to the clinical symptoms of dementia. Now, what we now know from biomarker studies, as well as autopsy studies, is that the accumulation of beta amyloid plaques and tau tangles occurs very slowly over many years. And in fact, the accumulation might begin in individuals who are middle-aged in the absence of clinical symptoms. That is, while they're still cognitively normal. That means that 20 years or more before symptoms appear, the brain changes of Alzheimer's disease might begin. So because AD pathology accumulates gradually over many years, the progression of the disease shows a very long course. So going back to the figure I showed you earlier, we see dementia on the right, and individuals with dementia have widespread Alzheimer's disease pathology. They demonstrate noticeable changes in memory, thinking, or behavior, and they demonstrate cognitive decline that interferes with their everyday activities, as I mentioned earlier. And then again, over time, they have difficulty functioning independently. However, this dementia phase is typically preceded by a phase known as MCI, or mild cognitive impairment. Individuals with mild cognitive impairment have some Alzheimer's disease pathology, and they do demonstrate cognitive decline that's greater than expected for their age. In addition, this decline is of concern to themselves, to their families, or their close friends. However, individuals with mild cognitive impairment are able to carry out everyday activities and are oftentimes able to continue working. And importantly, Mild cognitive impairment does not always progress to dementia. However, because Alzheimer's disease pathology begins to accumulate many, many years before individuals even develop clinical symptoms of dementia, we now know that there's a preclinical phase of the disease in which individuals have measurable AD pathology that the brain can compensate for. So individuals in the preclinical phase of Alzheimer's disease have normal cognition, they might demonstrate subtle cognitive changes, but these subtle changes are very difficult to separate from normal aging. And importantly, individuals in the preclinical stage do not always progress to MCI or dementia. So what this long disease course means is that effective treatments are likely to vary by disease stage. So among individuals with dementia, when Alzheimer's disease pathology is widespread, Effective treatments are likely going to treat the symptoms of the disease and slow clinical decline. Among individuals with mild cognitive impairment who have some Alzheimer's disease pathology, effective treatments are likely to slow progression. Whereas for individuals in the preclinical stage who have 
measurable adipathology that the brain can compensate for, effective treatments are likely to be those that delay or prevent onset or progression. So how do we get there? Well, really we have a need for more clinical research of all types. Clinical research is medical research that involves people, and it's led to the discovery of every disease treatment prescribed today. Importantly, there are multiple different types of research studies. So for example, observational studies are designed to our, improve our understanding of risk factors, health conditions, and diseases that increase or decrease the likelihood of cognitive decline and memory loss. So for example, a study on memory and aging might involve annual evaluations of cognition and physical function, or an observational study might involve coming in for brain imaging, such as an MRI study, but observational studies do not involve medications or interventions. In contrast, intervention studies, such as clinical trials, are designed to determine whether interventions help prevent or treat memory loss or dementia. So this might include drugs or medication trials, but it also might include lifestyle changes, such as physical exercise or the management of vascular risks, and whether, the, whether those types of interventions help to prevent or treat memory loss. And importantly, anyone can be a research participant. So it's critical for studies to have participants of different sexes, races, and ethnicities, because when we conduct research studies in only similar groups of people, we don't know the extent to which our findings apply to or benefit everyone. So with that, I'd like to leave you with a call to action. The first is to use your voice. Speak up about your health concerns with your health care provider because early diagnosis is beneficial and sometimes memory problems can be due to treatable causes. Use your voice to raise awareness about memory loss and dementia. This will help us reduce some of the stigma surrounding dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Or use your voice to raise awareness about the importance of research. Or second, if you're so inclined, participate in research yourself. Research studies are always looking for individuals, and then anyone can be a participant, whether you have normal cognition, mild memory problems, or dementia. And then lastly, learn about ways you might reduce your risk of cognitive decline in dementia. So this might include managing vascular risk factors, such as high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and diabetes, and staying mentally and physically active, because all of these activities have a beneficial impact on brain health. So in summary, dementia refers to a broad category of brain diseases, and it's different from normal aging. Dementia due to Alzheimer's disease characterized by specific changes to the brain, which are thought to begin many years before clinical symptoms appear. And more research is needed. We need to improve our understanding of healthy aging, as well as of diseases that cause memory loss. We need to do so in order to find ways of reducing risks for memory loss and memory disorders and for finding improved treatments for these disorders. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I've included my name and email address here. Thank you.